rank, you know, the kind of foreign policy ranks, the consultantship ranks, I guess that's more of a recent thing. Um, what they come to fixate on more was the way in which Kissinger successfully pushed those frontiers of American power. Um, you know, after the 1973 war, um, Kissinger assiduously cultivated Egypt and pushed it from the Soviet or got it from, you know, the, the Nasserite era Soviet orbit. So, okay, okay, I hear you. Oh, I'm going, you... I, 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 I was okay. running, uh, my Yeti as the input, but. Uh, there it is. Okay, it. perfect. Yeah. We did. Sorry about that. No okay, problem. look, we succeeded. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I started all... off, I started by saying, uh, after having my guys on, I'm having you on, uh, this week, two powerful mustache, uh, two powerful mustachioed, uh, journalists. Also, I used to work with Mike like 12 years ago at Wired. I love that guy. Oh, wow. That's sick. Okay. Perfect. I'm gonna have Noah Colwin on as well. I don't know if you have good words. Oh, great. No, no, no. That's perfect. I can't wait to perfect guy to have in this conversation. Yeah, he's uh, uh apparently at blowback season uh f what are they on five now? Let me take five, a look. Yeah. yeah, I think uh blowback season five is going to uh specifically feature uh Kissinger, which by the way, I mean, if you're doing anything about blowback, I mean, oh yeah, they're doing it on Cambodia apparently. It's uh oh, certainly perfect. yeah, he's certainly the perfect guy. Um, but yeah, so you wrote an obituary, which uh, many people are, at least in my community, were very excited to read. Uh, I want to ask you, every journalist uh, is almost a cliche. Every journalist has a, a, an obituary for Henry Kissinger. When did you actually write this? So um, my friend, no, 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 it's fine. Um, it was finished by June-ish of of 2022 um and it was commissioned my friend noah shackman who i worked for um at wired and then again at the daily beast who's now the editor-in-chief of rolling stone um right before um we each left the daily beast donald rumsfeld died <laughs> and we did an obituary that noah headlines something like donald rumsfeld killer of 400,000 people dies peacefully and um, we, we definitely knew, particularly um, seeing how, I think, pretty straight, like a recitation of Donald Rossfeld's record there was in that piece compared to like the way a lot of other obituaries of him, you know, soft peddled the destruction he unleashed upon Iraq, Afghanistan and beyond. Um, we really wanted to do something um, again. And uh, once, no, I think fairly soon after he got to Rolling Stone, like he thought, um, well, you know, Kissinger is something like 98 years old. Might as well have something ready. Um, yeah. So he asked me if I wanted to do it. I could not have said yes fast enough. <laughs> um, I, I spent at least a couple weeks um, reading and rereading stuff. Um, whatever anyone wants to think about um, Seymour Hirsch at this point in his career, um, when he wrote uh, The Price of Power, um, his biography of Kissinger, like he was at the absolute height of his powers. That, that book is really incredible, um, especially considering how much of it um, Hirsch reports himself um, based on really extensive um, shoe leather reporting that he did. Um, there's, um, I'm, I'm going to forget, um, the guy's name, but he was the justice minister, um, in the communist, um, regime in Vietnam after, um, the American war defeat. Um, and he wrote, um, a memoir, uh, he wrote something called Viet Cong memoir, um, about his time, um, in, in the revolution. And, it was it was good to it was interesting to reread that to see like the Vietnamese perspective, um, which is surprisingly um, respectful of Kissinger, like in the way that they, you know, the guy wrote of an adversary, a defeated adversary. So it probably has that flavor um, of, of, you know, perhaps magnanimity. But nevertheless, like there was a respect for what they saw as as Kissinger's intellect in implementing an evil policy that wreaked devastation um, upon, upon their land. Um, so 
after a while, I just like wondered if there had been some secret deal that Kissinger had made with some kind of metaphysical power because he just time went by and he just hadn't died. And um, after it was weird then when he finally died last night and, and then they published the piece at Rolling Stone um, to suddenly like reread some of it because it had been so long. Yeah, it's um, I mean, he was at, at a time of his passing. Uh, I think I believe he was one of the last remaining top administration officials on the uh, Nixon administration. Uh, and, and it had been that way for quite some time. As a matter of fact, um, speaking of writing obituaries ahead of time, this is something that people, I guess, don't know in my audience, which is why I asked you when you wrote yours. Um, in the New York Times obituary for Henry Kissinger that immediately came out, uh, one of the journalists that had uh, written, uh, that had contributed to said obituary, had passed, I believe, 13 years ago. Like, or. Oh, or, yeah, that happened. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, that is how. Yeah, here it is. The Financial Times had, had Henry Kissinger's obituary prepared so long that one of the people who wrote it died in 1999. Incredible. Malcolm yeah, Rutherford. Like that. Yeah. R.I.P. R.I.P. Malcolm. Yeah. So, um, one thing I will say is I do think, for me specifically, I obviously have a bias uh, towards uh, American imperialism. I cover it quite frequently. And... Um, because of that, I, I, I guess, like, uh, there's two things I want to talk about. One, Henry Kissinger is not unique uh, in, in many ways, I would say. Uh, I don't think that his, his policies, like, if we look at uh, a broader analysis of, of American imperialism, American involvement globally post-World War II, I would say that every single administration has had his, its own version of war crimes and and uh, which uh, Henry Kissinger in many ways uh, continued. Indonesia in particular uh, comes to mind, maybe accelerated, yeah. but still continued on the same trajectory. And uh, that's pre-Kissinger, that's 1965. Exactly. And I think that, uh, and post-Kissinger as well. So uh, in many ways, I think Henry Kissinger is a good person to use as a jump off point to describe to people America's like Cold War policies, um, especially because he's like widely regarded by many as uh, as just a bad guy, surprisingly so. Obviously, uh, outside of the the foreign policy apparatus, outside of like you know uh, people who consider him an elderly statesman, people in actual position of power, they love him. But most Americans, I would say, even liberals uh, across the board, are not too fond of him. Like boomers still have that Cold War era uh, liberalism, and, and uh, I guess like that plays a role in in his in in everyone uh, roundly criticizing him. So I like to use him as a jump off point, but I don't think that he is a, I mean, he was uniquely evil, but I don't think that uh, he is, he is deviated away from American foreign policy as a whole. So the way I would put it is that Kissinger is not unique, but he is exemplary from yeah. the perspective of um, whether you want to look at it exclusively as uh, a product of the Cold War, or if you want to look at it more broadly as um, the rise of American um, imperial hegemony um, or something like that, you would look at Kissinger and say, like, that's that's the goat. Like, that's the best to ever do it. Um, the person who not just um, takes the experiment as as far um, as it can go, like, beyond the boundaries of what was acceptable at the time. And that therein, I think, lies really a, a reason that you identify for why um, there's this, you know, hesitation even among, like, Cold War boomer liberals to be, like, the full embrace of, of Kissinger, but we'll get there in a second. Um, Kissinger is, like, the unmasked face of, yeah. of what American foreign policy is that, that there's, there's no, and that's why it's so grotesque to see the, the adulation for him, the fame, the wealth, um, yeah. the, the deference 
um, from all sides. The idea that like this was essentially from, you could really say, um, one of the absolute titans of, of American statecraft, seen as such by those who want to be like him. There's a line in the piece that's like, when Anthony Lake or Hillary Clinton looks at Kissinger, um, however much they might find, you know, this or that thing that he did beyond the pale or even, you know, morally um, despicable, they see themselves as they wish to be. Kissinger, it's, you know, the, the myth and the legend of Kissinger more than the actual reality. But like there was until it became useful for neoconservatives later to kind of rewrite this as a period of, of, of weakness. Um, that accelerated turns to um, like militant neoliberalism would rectify. But back then it looked like Kissinger had given um, American foreign policy um, salvation from the ashes of Vietnam. And yeah. over time, it became more and more distasteful to dwell on what those ashes were made of and what the emergence from them was in terms of continuity rather than departure. And there you have, among other things, the, you know, illegal bombing of Cambodia um, and Laos. And, you know, Cambodia, just, just, to, that, just to do one thing about, about this, because a lot of people have focused on the headline of the piece. Laos was a, I'm sorry, Cambodia was a formally neutral country in yeah. the Vietnam US conflict bombing it to say nothing of how extensively Nixon and Kissinger bombed it for um it was i believe 14 months of secret bombing a secret bombing in which um something like 100,000 out of Cambodia's population of 7 million perished um a bombing about which uh Kissinger said to his his aide Al Haig anything that flies, anything that moves. So when we talk about Henry Kissinger as a war criminal, we're not being hyperbolic. Like all of yeah. the things I have described, bombing a neutral country, anything that flies, anything that moves, not the basis of, to, sorry to be a little bit um, all over the place here, but the basis of international humanitarian law, such as it is, save your jokes, we know them, um, none of them are wrong, um, is what's called the principles of proportionality and distinction, which is to say you distinguish enemies from civilians and from proportionality's perspective, you only take the amount of force minimally necessary, you know, to achieve your objective. We've, we've blown through all, th all of these conditions. Then we get to illegal from the United States' perspective because it was not a declared act of war by Congress. Um, this plays a crucial role in the creation, not that it will ultimately matter in practice, of the 1973 War Powers Resolution meant to stop um, secret bombings like this um, and, and, and non-declared wars proliferating all over the globe. Now, fast forward 40 years, that just is Ameri like that is uncontroversially a picture of American foreign policy as a post 9-11 feature. Yeah. And I would argue that one of the reasons that it has been able to become that way is because there was absolutely no consequences for Henry Kissinger. This was at one point in time. I did not know this until I did my research for this piece. It, and, and, and an amazing, you know, historical um, fact that this, you know, indicates the secret bombing of Cambodia was one of the original articles of impeachment against Richard Nixon that comes out of Watergate and also the leaks of which in the Pentagon and the Pentagon papers, you know, spur the thing, you know, Watergate saga in the first place. But eventually that gets stripped out of, of the, the Nixon impeachment um, at, you know, ultimately preempted because Nixon resigned. Um, but, you know, it, it is impossible not to, you know, take a moment to imagine a world in which one of the reasons that a president was removed from office um, was waging a secret war and what that would have meant. Possibly nothing, and we'll never know. But what well, I mean, precedent we... and deterrent effect that might have had 
No, no what president after would ever US do such a thing, policy. right? No, no president after would do such a thing. Wage secret wars. I know. Wars Can on... you, yeah, <laughs> cert, you know, certainly not. You know, f four in a row. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, no, I think that a level of accountability instilled in that moment maybe could have potentially at least like reigned America's bloodthirsty endeavors in just marginally or at least like apply some level of process to it because it's not like Western powers are, are uh, somehow better than, than all of our foreign adversaries that we often orientalize and, and look at or look down at. Like um, an example I use often is... is there's bribery that is uh, uh, commonplace in, in some countries like Pakistan, right? But we yeah. already have corporate lobbying. We have basically codified bribery, so it somehow seems more normal and, and institutionalized and therefore better. Uh, and, and this in and of itself would have probably found, like, the American powers uh, yeah. would still figure out a way around it. There are rules for it this way. Yeah. There are rules for it that wrote bribery into, like, the, the realm of the respectable. It, it would have been and, more civil yeah. and, and maybe better paper trail as a consequence of such uh, civility. But uh, I, I do think that America would still continue its, its uh, bloodshed. Um, yes, I mean, th this was also, you know by design, you know, institutionally, the policies that Nixon created, that Nixon and Kissinger created, um, some of which were, were, were more Nixon than Kissinger, in particular China, which is, I think, easily the biggest, you know, success and most consequential um, aspect, um, maybe not the most consequential aspect, um, given, you know, all of the human suffering of Nixon's foreign policy. But, you know, nevertheless, this is, what I would say, you know, Kissinger um, and Nixon at this point in history are a crucial turn of the ratchet in order to institutionalize this this corruption and this bloodshed. One of the things that I wanted to do in the piece is look at places where Kissinger not only destroyed, but built. And that, you know, brings you right into Chile in 1970 you know, to 73 where after the democratic election of a socialist president, Salvador Allende, um, immediately Kissinger sets to work seeking to overthrow Allende, including with an extremely January 6th-like CIA plan to stop the Chilean Senate from seating Allende, even though he had won the election. And, yeah. you know, Kissinger had like, in, like epic lines, Cy Hirsch's book has this, um, the price, the price of power, like epic lines from people who were in the room talking about like Kissinger was saying things like, you know, why should the fact that, you know, wh you know, why should we let a small thing like a Chilean public opinion get in the way of stopping a government that's going communist and, you know, quotes from, uh, quotes from aides to, Nixon and Kissinger talking about how Kissinger thought precisely because we now had an example of elected socialism in the Americas that Allende was more dangerous than Castro. Yeah. Um, now you're, if Noah Coleman's going to be, if Noah Coleman's going to be on, he can, he can run with that. But the point I'm driving at is that ultimately this culminates in us support in 1973 for um, Pinochet's coup, for the thousands that he kills, for the tens of thousands that he tortures and disappears, um, and the entire reign of terror um, that emerges from it has Kissinger's extremely enthusiastic blessing, um, and ultimately is for a purpose, which is to create a laboratory of neoliberalism. They invite all of these Chicago school economists to design a um, thoroughly privatized economy, stripping, like really like, you know, stripping away at all of the worker protections that uh, Chileans had come to enjoy and ultimately decimating the ability of the Chilean working class to ultimately benefit from the society that its labor was creating. And there, 
we see Nixon's, I'm sorry, we see Kissinger's contribution to shaping the world that we currently live in. Yeah. Um, the Justin liberal world order, uh, as you call it, uh, as you talked about with as, uh, as that, that, yeah, that's Hillary, Hillary Clinton. 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 Yeah. 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 The continuation of that uh, is, is definitely uh, demonstrated. I, I feel like he's uh, like Henry Kissinger. I wouldn't say he's the turning point for this because I, I like I said, I, 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 I think that there's always been bipartisan consensus with like maybe marginal deviation on methods and tactics or how aggressively uh, America wants to pursue uh, imperialist actions uh, and destabilization in certain parts of the world. But um, the fact that I think Americans, uh, or sorry, American leadership, like Democratic Party leadership, regularly celebrated Henry Kissinger shows uh, that, you know, this is, uh, this has always been a bipartisan, uh, this has always been a bipartisan initiative. And uh, I mean, after... 9-11, I would say it's like an even more pivotal point where this, this became permanent, where even on the ground, the, the uh, anti-war uh, activism of the, of the Democratic Party completely subsided. It was, it was over after that. I, and we have, yet to see, um, we have yet to see any kind of movement in that direction uh, until recently, as a matter of fact. I would say the, the uh, pro-Palestinian... Yeah, yeah, the pro-Palestinian protests are the first time in my, you know, 32 years of being alive have I ever seen, and I've only lived in America since 2013, or uh, 20, uh, 2009, is the first time I've seen, like, genuine activism in that direction happening within the Democratic Party again, and they're, of course, aggressively trying to clamp down on it. Um, speaking of which, uh, while we're talking about Kissinger, I mean, he had his fingers in, in everything, obviously. What would you... What would you say was, um, like, his main motivation? Because a lot of people talk about realpolitik and, and how it's, it deviates away from American exceptionalism and whatever, but ultimately, I don't think there was that, that much of a deviation, I guess, with, with some notable exceptions. But beyond that... Well, I that, think the realpolitik... Yeah. yeah. I Go think, ahead. you know, the, the, the realpolitik just serves the exceptionalism. And the point is... The, yeah. It's not even exceptionalism for for its own sake. What it is is um, recognizing that these are ideological justifications for achieving, sustaining, and pushing the frontiers of American imperial control. And I can't read Nixon's mind. I'm sorry, I can't read Kissinger's mind. I can only read Kissinger's words. And the impression left particularly by his famous work, you know, A World Restored, is that he believed um, it, you can't really translate it into 20th century terms so well, but like his sense of what uh, order required was imperial domination. And I don't really think it matters to to ask whether that was, you know, believed or, you know, cynical or what. I think all that matters is that it is a useful means to an end of wielding American power for the purpose of imperial domination for sustaining that empire and for pushing the frontiers of its influence, um, you know, really far. And, you know, Kissinger, this is why I use the term um, that, you know, he's a turn of the ratchet. He's not, you know, a thing that makes um, the difference between, you know, not being, you know, an empire and being an empire. Um, it's, you know, when you think of the way, you know, after a while, um, people like in the Democratic Party foreign policy orbit, you know, came into power. A lot of it, you know, had to do with um, the widespread anger at the Vietnam War, of which, you know, Kissinger by the, you know, early to mid 70s was a symbol of. And then after a while, as they ascend through the kind of um rank, you know, the kind of foreign policy ranks, the consultantship ranks, I guess that's more of a recent thing. Um, 
what they come to fixate on more was the way in which Kissinger successfully pushed those frontiers of American power. Um, you know, after the 1973 war, um, Kissinger assiduously cultivated Egypt and pushed it from the Soviet or got it from, you know, the, the Nasserite era Soviet orbit into the American orbit where after Camp David, it stayed ever since. Um, you can, I think, probably view Chile in the same way in terms there, of there's um, also expanding. there's also a continuation here that I'm I'm yeah. personally very interested in because like I think in some ways it you can you can draw a direct through line from that onwards with uh, some exceptions along the way with Yitzhak Rabin maybe but even then not too much of a deviation from the standard all the way to the Abraham Accords of like cutting out like securing relationships with regional partners regional Arab leadership and, and cutting out Palestinians from the deal altogether while simultaneously uh, at this point, it's a little bit different because like those relationships have become permanent. These are basically uh, de facto client states now, like the Gulf nations in the region. But um, at that time, uh, uh, ripping Egypt away from uh, any kind of uh, Soviet sphere of influence and then doing that while simultaneously, uh, secretly, and sometimes not so secretly, backing the Israeli leadership, I think, is is exactly uh, how American foreign policy has continued and only expanded on that, that same principle. It's important to remember that in foreign policy circles, the, the, like, like the circles that make foreign policy, as opposed to discussing it from the outside... Um, or like from the briefly out of power. Um, the scale of opinion is, is you know, Kissinger, um, effective son of a bitch, um, or titan of the American project. Like there's, there's not much, you know, viewing of him that lacks respect. There, there just isn't. And it's, it's, it's been um, an education, an ongoing education. This is one of the reasons why I wrote my obituary the way I did to talk about not just Kissinger and his, what his works were, but to kind of turn it in on us and ask, like, what does his impunity, his freedom, his wealth, his fame um, have to say about American elites. And it's an exceptionally ugly story that ultimately boils down to saying millions of lives don't matter. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, Henry Kissinger's uh, endless interest in, in brown nosing uh, and also like playing the role of like a rather famous figure, uh, despite being like a dude with a PhD from Harvard and then onwards in a, a, a guy in in a in a prominent political role like the 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 fact that he was able to also uh play the song and dance of being a part of like the new york elite uh and uh you know maybe even his um maybe even his uh like dating history even and all the wealth and all of the uh the fame that came along with it i think uh helped uh, solidify him as a figure, as, as a permanent fixture, but also on top of that, the fact that he never got any sort of uh, punishment directed towards him for uh, doing all of these awful things, like openly engaging in war crimes, is because if it, it, it begs the question, if Henry Kissinger is to be tried, right? Obviously, that's a laughable notion. Who is going to try him? How could they ever do this? Like, is Laos and Cambodia going to do such a thing? Are they going to be able to, you know, cut trade relations with America or invade America or, you know, uh, engage right. in war with America? There's no way that they could do that, right? Um, but, but it begs the question, if that happens, yes. then what, you know, does it, you know, what's then to stop you know, Kissinger from pointing around at all of the rest of you in the foreign policy establishment. And yes. you were there and you were there. And what else, you know, what and about, he, you know, and the Bundys before me? What about, yeah, yes. on and on and on. Yes, because um, every single American president uh, and every single administration before Chris Kissinger and certainly after Kissinger has conducted themselves in an almost identical way. 
even though he was, you know, exceptional, as you said, in the way that he uh, conducted his affairs, he was far exemplary. He was exemplary. Sorry, not exceptional. He was exemplary. Um, you know, you have George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, and that administration, and many members of that administration, which are uh, which should immediately be tried for war crimes, right? And and um, pretty much and every single president. And again, you know, there's a lot of talk and understandably so um, and appropriately so about normalization and the dangers of normalization. And, you know, something that I kind of write about a lot um, is the unresolved status of the war on terror. And one of the reasons why it feels not unresolved, you know, since October 7th is a different story, but one of the reasons that it is often felt in the like popular imagination to be resolved is by how normalized it just became until yeah. it was no longer, it was no longer like newsworthy, even when the stuff wasn't, you know, hidden from the public view, which it more frequently than not was, it was no longer exemplary to say, well, another drone strike. Um, it's just what U S foreign policy becomes. And it's really important to remember that this is a choice that publics make that they can also not make if they organize themselves and they are strong enough to like make these demands. And with Nixon and Kissinger getting away with, I should say, you know, Nixon resigned. Kissinger did not. So like there, you know, Nixon was disgraced. Kissinger never was. And the way in which that created not just a sense of, of, that what he did could ultimately, you know, be defended. It, you know, teaches no different than, you know, you teach a child like, oh, that's actually okay. You can, you, there's no consequence for that. And more and more people then become like, eventually it's good that we, you know, it's, then it becomes, it's necessary that we do this routinely. And then it becomes, it's valorous that we do this routinely. And Kissinger by, you know, going from, you know, outrage and resignation, you know, the famous defense intellectual Thomas Schelling, um, you know, denounced the the secret bombing of Cambodia once it became public. Um, and now, you know, people don't bat an eye at this stuff. And it becomes just sort of part of your resume in the foreign policy establishment. And it's weirder if you don't have it. Yeah, I think it also makes it much easier, in my opinion, to just like, uh, never really talk about the uh, the the awfulness of that era because that makes it easier to justify what we're doing now. If you don't think about um, you know the the <laughs> the five hundred and eighty thousand bombing missions on Laos between nineteen sixty four and nineteen seventy three, um, then all of a sudden it's uh it's it's much easier to to justify what's going on now because you say yeah those stuff uh we don't know the extent of yeah. the crimes we don't know the extent of the violence but yeah that stuff was bad but right now what's going on right now well this this is good it's good this time america's involvement and interference we, in world affairs is good this time right there's a, there's there there's a sense that you know we learned we've learned our lesson you know but you, if the activities that you're conducting are institutionalized criminality on a mass scale. Um, and we can go into so much detail about the various different avenues those, those criminal activities take in their institutional courses. Only real penalty, reputational, criminal penalty, financial penalty can teach the disciplining lesson that you can't do that. It's why we have laws in the first place. It's just that this is an enterprise where, you know, only the low level torturer, if that, you know, bears the consequence of the institutionalized criminality. And the point of making that person bear it is to say what they did was criminal, but that was different than what we did, which was policy. Yeah. Um, 
it's it's also identical in the way that we conduct our affairs uh, globally, where we look at yeah, like we look at foreign adversaries and their war crimes, and you know, plenty of foreign adversaries have engaged in such actions. Uh, that much is this is definitely, definitely not certain. an exclusively. Definitely yeah. not an exclusively American activity, even if it is an American particular competency. Yes. The only difference between us and them, however, is that when our foreign adversaries engage in uh, acts that would be declared understandably war crimes, that is an opportunity for America to engage with them and actually do our uh, much more devastating uh, war crimes to them uh, without any such condemnation. Um, the The... The grip of power that America has on the international rule-based order uh, dictates that we get to do war crimes when our enemies, when our foreign adversaries have done any kind of war crimes. And if, even if they haven't at that point, we can just say that they have and then continue interfering in their affairs and, and being uh, and, and devastating entire regions. This is why it's so important to challenge the concept of American exceptionalism. Because what American exceptionalism says is that I mean there's a story that it that that American exceptionalism tells about like the uniquely virtuous and uniquely you know freedom forged um virtues that that make America um you know reluctantly you know a necessary force for good on the world stage but but what what it's really saying is that the rules don't and can't apply to America America enforces those rules and secondly, it creates this, like, just crazy framework for thinking that there should be no sense of consistency, um, that we don't judge these acts, in fact, by how disgusting they are, how damaging they are, no matter who commits them. We judge them according to who commits them. We admit their monstrosity when it suits American prerogatives. We deny its monstrosity when it doesn't suit American prerogatives. And when it suits American prerogatives, we will also aid, if not actively commit, such monstrous acts. I don't know yeah. if that is, is my Israel is a in, but I'm 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 streaming right now. That I can't I can't I can't. We, no, okay, my, sorry. My family, my family's right uh, on the other side of the year as well. They're 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 yapping, <laughs> so I, I get it. <laughs> um, what, what I was gonna say is, uh, yeah, what you're what you're describing is is perfectly. I mean, it's so prescient, especially in this very moment where Anthony Blinken is uh, in Israel once again, uh, and and uh, the the ceasefire, the the six day truce is slated to end, um, uh, today. And, uh, and oh my god, and we know. We know, uh, we know the monstrosity uh, and the and the war crimes that Israel has committed, war crimes that you have just, been greenlighted. You but, just also coined like a really insane phrase. If it turns out not to extend six day truce, like that's yeah. a bleak, bleak phrase given the history of of of, of the region, the resonance, of course, with the six day war. Um, yeah. Well, if that's that's a bleak one, but like, you know, what was Blinken saying in Israel? He was saying the war is going to go back on. We expect it to operate within these parameters. It's, 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 I've, I've definitely seen arsonists play firefighter before, but I haven't seen them play firefighter while simultaneously like giving the arsonist the Molotov cocktail. Yeah. Um, Blinken has said, uh, as of an hour ago, according to Washington Post, that the pause in fighting has been producing results as more hostages are being freed. Yesterday, there was a point of contention between Hamas and, and uh, Israel on how many hostages were being released and who the hostages were. I believe they produced uh, seven women and children uh, amongst uh, the, the remaining hostages that Israel claimed was not enough and that they were going to continue its bombing campaign which I suspect is the reason why Blinken's there. Now, of course, I don't believe that Blinken is there because of, uh, because of his genuine interest in like, maintaining peace. Uh, I think it's, it's getting to a point where uh, it, it is undeniably, like Israel's actions are undeniably becoming a problem for American foreign policy because it undermines and, American and, influence. And for, and for Biden, to, sorry to interrupt you, and for Biden domestically, for, yeah. for the prospect of him, of him being reelected. And so now you have... The spectacle um, from Blinken of 
trying to like have the emphasis in one audience be, ah, we told Israel it had to limit its war. While to the Israeli audience, it's saying like, yeah, it's back on, go. And right before what you called the six day truce, um, the Israeli defense minister, Yoav Gawan, um, was quoted as saying that once the truce ends, he expects two more months of war. Now, yeah. if you know anything of it, I'll just put it like this. It took nine months for the U.S., the Iraqis, and the Iranians to oust ISIS from Mosul, a place where they had nowhere near the, the you know, durable ties, local knowledge, like embedding in the, in the local, you know, patterns of life, infrastructure, all of it. That Hamas ISIS has did not have for, a civil governance division uh, actively working for the past, uh, you know, fifteen years. Or, there's or no way of do. Yeah, so like it's militarily laughable to say that two months can achieve Israel's objectives. It can't because Israel's state of objectives are euphemistic and function and pretty much pretextual. What Gallant is saying, they have two more months of international leeway as they judge it to decimate Gaza and allow pogroms in the West Bank. That's what, you know, two months means. That's the stakes of returning to a state of, of fighting instead of extending this truce. And there, there just shouldn't be um, like any illusion that there's something that like Israel can achieve in terms of the objectives that it set out for itself. It can't uproot Hamas. I mean, this was in many ways real. I wrote a piece about this, you know, at the start of this for the nation that was headlined something like, you know, the lesson of 9-11 is that Israel cannot win its war. But the reality of the statement, what, what's clear about this is that it's not about uprooting Hamas from Gaza. It's about uprooting Palestinians from Gaza. It's yeah. about making Gaza uninhabitable. The death toll that we've seen already is going to be, we know, like from every war that's ever happened, from the warnings of the WHO right now, the deaths that are going to come are going to come from disease, from, um, from lack of the sanitation infrastructure, from the fact that Israel destroyed the healthcare infrastructure in Gaza. That's what's going to ultimately be even deadlier than... I don't even know how much the estimated death toll is at this point. It, I, you well, know, it a was part of that is we can't figure that out. Yeah, we can't figure it, that out because yeah. we've the, Israel has destroyed the healthcare infrastructure that was reporting on the matter. Before, yeah. they, before they destroyed the healthcare infrastructure that was adequately reporting on the matter, there was also another moment where the Biden administration played a devastating role in undermining the confidence that they historically had on the Gazan Health Ministry by claiming that those numbers are unreliable. Yeah in the aftermath of the El Ahli uh, explosion, which, uh, uh, which led to this, this major, which played a major role in, in the propaganda war uh, at the behest of Israel. Like they, since then, uh, I, I have seen so many times that like uh, the, the media changed its style guide, started reporting on uh, health ministry yeah. numbers as like the Gazan, uh, Hamas backed Gazan health ministry numbers, like always with a, with a, uh, always a douse of skepticism. Uh, one that is never offered to the IDF, which is routinely lied. If we're looking at like the inconsistent information coming or the historic track record coming from uh, Hamas backed or even Hamas uh, directed uh, uh, organs of information in comparison to the Israeli government, the Israeli government greatly, uh, greatly uh, uh, outweighs. I mean, there's so much more misinformation that has come out of the Israeli front both from Knesset members, both from uh, all of the organs of information, uh, and and it I, definitely deserves skepticism. Like any serious I'm journalist so, should I'm, be skeptical. I'm so old. I remember when underneath the Al Shifa Hospital complex there was the Hamas Command and Control Center. Yeah, um, you, you you know it's it it compounds, and journalists have to ask themselves, you know, really honestly. 
what kinds of credible sources from all sides they are they are actually confronting. And in so many cases, I, look, Israel, you know, it, like Israel keeps first Israel is killed something like I I, I apologize for not knowing the total Almost number, 60 but some, journalists. Thank you. Yes, over fifty for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, since that since this has begun, and it stops journalists from seeing Gaza for themselves independently, and you know, you, you to tie this back because I think what my daughter was indicating there is that um, I'm I'm going to have to go. Um, to tie this back to Kissinger, I wrote a piece. This is also in the Kissinger obit somewhat. But I wrote a piece for the nation um, in it, that's in its current issue. Um, I'm very honored to have that be the issue um, with Mohammed El Kurd's incredible cover story, um, uh, "The Right to Speak for Ourselves." Um, and this piece was called "Gaza Shows the Difference Between International Law and the Rules-Based International Order." It is really. It just as obvious as it was for Kissinger being a war criminal, Israel throughout the Gaza war and before the occupation of the West Bank is illegal. It has been illegal for 50 years. So the routine violation of the normalized violation of international law by Israel can happen because Israel has something stronger than that. It has the U.S. rules-based international order, which operates on the rules of American exceptionalism that we've been talking about before. Kissinger brought that rules-based order to um, an extreme height, a height that would subsequently be surpassed. Um, but in the, the Mount Rushmore of American empire builders, you know, he's like really high up um, as a statue, a monument soaked in blood. That's a weird metaphor to mix, uh, but but that's how I'm gonna I'm gonna get here. Okay, uh, Spencer Ackerman, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, hope to have you again. Uh, I hope to have you on again soon. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll be we'll be uh, reading your your work uh, later on in the broadcast as well. Can I just say one more thing before I go? If any of this for me yes. has made sense, and you are interested. In superhero comics, I on December twelfth, the final issue of my four issue mini series for DC Comics uh, called Waller vs. Wildstorm gets published. That'll be collected um, and released in January. Um, but uh, very much that is um, a story about everything we've just been talking about um, as a kind of spycraft murder mystery. So just needed to plug that. Yeah, one one thing I will say. Okay, okay. I know you need to leave, uh, but before you leave, oh, as as a comic book uh, fan, uh, and and one uh, who has made comic books himself, uh, yourself, how do you feel about the uh, the Mossad Marvel hero? Uh, oh my her? god! Have me back up. Her name is Sabra. Sabra. Um, <laughs> I actually have. I mean, this will never get made, so I might as well say it. I have an unpublishable pitch for uh, a Sabra story um, that, you know, Marvel, if you're listening, I doubt it would ever possibly be able to be published. Uh, but uh, I have some thoughts about writing Sabra and the purposes for which uh, one writes Sabra. But like, to be, to be clear, when this character goes into... Um, the the movie that's gonna happen i think it's a captain america movie buddy be prepared for just how heroic this presentation is going to be like oh, that's God. going to be a rough thing to watch it is going to be if you thought you know gal gadot wonder woman saving uh the little kids from the missile uh <laughs> was something just wait until you see Sabra and Captain America valiantly in action together. She's going to, she's going to participate in Sabra and Shatila, but heroically the bad guys, uh, she's going to, or, or she's going to save a camp of refugees from a Sabra and Shatila. Yeah. Oh, 100%. 
That's my as my uh, favorite like uh, trope of of America's war crimes are so awful that only our enemies must have done it in popular media like the Call of Duty, uh, the the bombing of the Highway of Death, uh, yeah. being attributed to uh, the Russians like an act of grave evil. Of course, it, it, only our foreign adversaries might uh, conduct themselves this way. We would never do that. That's all right, man. Thank you so much. All right, thank you for coming on, Spencer. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Take care. All right.